Hello and welcome to the Formidable Over 40 podcast. I'm Sarah Pittendrick, a mum, award-winning entrepreneur, cancer survivor, mentor and coach. This podcast is all about sharing stories and showing that you're never too old and it's never too late to design a life you love. On this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Annabelle Beforth, leading digital publisher in the wedding industry. Annabelle founded Love My Dress, an online platform for weddings that encourages heartfelt celebrations through honest storytelling and relatable content. It is one of the world's most popular wedding blogs and directories. She's also co-founder of What About Weddings, founded during the pandemic to give a voice to those working in the wedding sector at a time when it had been completely shut down. What About Weddings now continues to offer representation and support to those in the wedding industry. Outside of her business, Annabelle has a passion for photography, walking, yoga and nature and is a published author. Annabelle inspires others to live authentic lives after overcoming challenges to find magic wherever she can. So let's find out more about Annabelle's journey on this episode of the Formidable Over 40 podcast. Good morning, Annabelle. How are you? I'm fine. I want to meet me because you just made me sound amazing. <laughs> you are. What do you mean? Thanks for that lovely introduction, Sarah. <laughs> it's the truth, isn't Appreciate it? it. It's the you. truth. <laughs> so, Annabelle, share for, okay. for any listeners who, who, who may not know who you are, share a little bit about yourself. Tell, tell us a bit, a bit about Annabelle. Well, I am, oh God, do we do the age thing straight away? 48, 48. <laughs> which is the new 38, which might even be the new 28 now. I am a mother of two. I live with my husband and my children who are 12 and 17 next week. And I live in beautiful rural North Yorkshire where I run my business from home, love my dress. And I have been running my business from home, well, since 2000. I started in 2009, but properly full-time since 2011. So I love it. I love being here. I just... Yeah, everything is is good for me. I love being with my dogs. Got five dogs. I'm not a crazy dog person, but yes, we have five dogs, and I just love it here. I love being away in this rural kind of idyll and away mm. from the madness of city life. Mm. So I'm definitely a country girl. Yeah, yeah, I totally relate to that, Annabelle. Totally. So formidable over forty. What does formidable over forty mean to you? It's an interesting concept, isn't it? I think. Formidable, like when I think of the word, for me, it makes me think capable and strong and able, you know? Mm. And I definitely feel more of that now than I have at any other point in my life. Definitely not when I was in my kind of directionless 20s or still trying to work things out 30s. Mm. I feel like I have, not that I've solved the big life puzzle, but I feel like. I'm stronger now and I'm more confident in myself than I ever have been. And that feels really good. I feel just better about myself physically and mentally. And that's not to say I don't have off days, you know, but Mm. I just feel more formidable than Mm. I ever have Mm. at any point in my life before now, which feels good. So if, I mean, that is just the most (laughs) wonderful, but it is, it's the most wonderful sort of self-fulfilling grounding feeling for you to feel that now. But, and and I'm sure we're going to talk about how you got to that place further on in our, in our interview. So if we go right back to, and and we start filling, filling the gaps of when, when Annabelle was 15, yeah, because I think 15 is such an impressionable <laughs> age, isn't it? And it can be very um, mm. sort of shaping, for want of a better word, can't it? It can really shape us, the impact of what happened to us in our former years. And it's been very interesting listening to yeah. my previous guests and their journey and what shaped them. And, and a lot of it was back to the to the youth and the childhood. So if if you're happy to describe your 15-year-old self, what, what was like life like for you, <laughs> Dreams, hobbies, what was going on? My wayward 15-year-old self. <laughs> Do you know what? I used that word directionless early on, and that's not something that, it's not a word I use really in my vocabulary, but that is how I felt when I was 15. Mm. And looking back now, I think I was one of those individuals that I didn't identify with the, the path that I think was being laid for me or that the intention, you know, from my parents and from the schooling system, you know, mum, if you listen to this, I love you so much. There's there's nothing, no, no deal there at all. But I think that there was an expectation, let's put it like that. There's an expectation that perhaps I, you know, go through higher education and then go to university and do all those normal things. 
And I just felt in every fiber of my being that I didn't want to do that. I felt like I, I felt myself rebelling against it. And for a long time, I think I identified as a rebel, you know, and I, I didn't do that. I, I started my A-levels and then dropped out because I was far more drawn to the idea of earning money. And it's so interesting because at the time I felt such a failure. And I look back now and I think, God, if only that was encouraged. You know, I mean, I wouldn't change anything because I'm here now. I'm my, you know, life's dealt me this, this destiny and I'm happy with that. But I just think at the time it was quite traumatic as a 15 year old to feel like I didn't fit in yes. anywhere. And I just felt this immense excitement and pleasure of finally having the responsibility of earning my own money. Mm. And I must tell you about my first job at some point because it's, it's quite hilarious. Tell us now. Um, tell us now. Go on. That's we, we, want, of... we want to have some. We <laughs> want to have a laugh. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's it's not it's not funny that like when it's so different to what I do now, and I'm, I'm not being disrespectful, but disrespectful to anybody so who would not do funny, a job ha, like ha, this. It's but just it's so funny. far removed. <laughs> no, it's just like how, the journey. When you look back at the journey, you know, and you think. Mm. How, hang on, how did you get from there to there? Yeah. It's kind of crazy. I mean, obviously the first jobs, you know, you start working at the pub and you clean the dishes. But my first proper taking home uh, paycheck at the end of the week was working in a factory that made abrasive sponges. <laughs> so, you know, the kind, well, any abrasive sponge to wipe down a surface or do your nails with. Yeah. And they had this these convoluted machines, like as long as a field where you'd feed in a bit of sponge at the start and I would sometimes be the feeder in and then that sponge would get coated with glue and grit and someone would take it out at the end and lay it on the pallet and it was doing that on repeat or boxing them or you know sweeping the floors and it didn't matter because I had the independence yeah. and I tasted the flavor of earning my own money mm -hmm. and it felt really good and it felt like the right thing for me yeah and my my um I think it was my wonderful mum who encouraged me to go to college and learn how to type in the evenings, which is one of the best things I ever did. So all these things are happening for me at 15, 16, and I felt quite lost, but it felt like the right thing to do. And mm. that kind of schism didn't make sense to me for a very long time. Yeah. Um, looking back now as an entrepreneur, I realized that I have probably always had entrepreneurial blood in yes. my body. I, and that was the start of feeling some of that, like, you know, I want to go out and create yes. this money for myself. I just didn't understand it because that wasn't taught at school. No. And nobody kind of really talked about that in our family. My grandpa was an entrepreneur, but he was the only entrepreneur I knew. And we never really had a discussion about, you know, well, this could be an option when you finish school and feel a bit lost and don't know yeah. what to do. Yes. So my 15, my, my, like my memories of that time aren't the best memories because I feel like I was struggling to fit in and find my tribe as well and my thing. But looking back, I'm really proud that I did what I did. And that, you know, effectively, I was making a big decision to step away from education. And and this, I've since learned that there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. No. Doing that. No, not you know, at all. Like I say to my, I've got, you know, older children now. And I say to them, you know, you can, I will support you whatever you decide to do in your life. But there's so many options. You don't have to do, you know, you don't have to go to college or university. There's apprenticeships you could consider. Mm. Um, you know, there's, there are different options. And I, I can see that now. As someone in my forties, I've learned yeah. the hard way. Yeah, and that's interesting, isn't it? Because you know, children who are fifty, well, teenagers, whatever you want to call them, at fifteen, they're often thought that they actually don't know what they want to do, and you know, and and the 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 teenagers, the creative kids with the entrepreneurial flair, who are the misunderstood kids, actually, sometimes versus the academic kids. The academic kids actually don't know what they want to do. So they go into university by to buy time. The creative kids really do know what they want to do, but they often haven't got that support network at 15 and 16 to, to help them channel that entrepreneurial flair. And this is where, as you say, they get stuck. And this is something that, you know, I think we are getting nearer with school in, in schools to, to sort of support this 100 but i yeah. do think there's such a long way to go because how many how many creative kids do you think have gone under the radar who've had real entrepreneurial flair and talent but they just haven't had the opportunity yeah absolutely and i'm sure it has changed now you know i've seen um my daughter's now at college she just started college my se nearly 17 year old in september this year but i mean she's starting to get the very first inklings of what she might want to do you know the kind i mean and that's only the kind of area she might want to move into career-wise and it's it's still 
just, you know, the fledgling of an idea. Mm. But you're right, who really knows what they want to do? But that those seeds of creativity and potential way back when I was 15 just weren't recognised or encouraged at all. Yeah. I do think it's different now, yeah. but still perhaps not where it should be or could be. Yeah, no, yeah. I followed exactly the same path as you. It was exactly the same at 15. I just wanted to earn money. I, I understood that m- to me money bought freedom <laughs> and I just wanted to be able to, you yeah. know, paddle my own canoe for want of a better word and I couldn't wait to get out of school and start earning. You know, it's uh, money and freedom, I felt. So <laughs> now if we jump right the way to what you're doing now and we talk about Love My Dress. Yeah. Your online wedding content platform. Yeah. So tell yeah. us, the, so you, you left school. Yes. And you had your job yeah. on the sponge the sponge line. Where did you go between the there sponge line. And, yeah. and creating Love My Dress? And then how did Love My Dress come about? <gasps> oh, gosh, it's a long and windy road, isn't it? Okay, so after that job, I can't remember how long it lasted, to be honest, but it was probably at least a couple of years. I ended up getting um, a, like an admin clerical job at a garage that sold cars. And then... That's right. I ended up working at a hospital after that. So I got some basic admin experience and ended up working at a hospital for like, I think, seven or eight years. And then I met my husband, who I married in 2009. And I moved up north. So I was in the Midlands. Oh, right. I grew up in the Midlands, mm-hmm. grew up in um, a little village called Great Haywood, which is near Stafford, kind of halfway between Manchester and Birmingham. And I met him. And sort of in, I think it was 2002, I moved up north to North Yorkshire and got a really great job, which also gave me like a career boost, a paycheck boost. And that was working at university. Um, And I oversaw two teams there and enjoyed it to a degree for a while. And then things started to kind of crack a little bit after I returned after having my second child. And looking back again, God, hindsight is so amazing, isn't it? You look back and you realise... I wasn't being my authentic self (laughs) working in that job. Um, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy doing that job and I didn't feel valued. And it got to a point because there were so many changes that were happening. There were were big changes actually that happened whilst I was away on maternity leave. So they moved things around. They actually changed my job and I didn't feel like I fit in when I got back, but I was treated differently as well when I got back. And that's that's a whole different story there about, you know, workplace bullying and intimidation and Mm -hmm. stuff, which I don't need to go into, but... I just wasn't happy. I actually got married. So um, Philip proposed to me on a very rainy day, like, like it is today. It's terrible today. It's blowing oh, really outside. <laughs> he proposed to me on a very, very rainy, windy, cold Christmas Eve in 2007. And weddings weren't on my radar at all prior to that. And the, the proposal was a completely beautiful surprise as well. It was lovely. Um, and I spent the next 15 months planning our wedding. So we married in March 2009. And it was in that period that I discovered the wedding industry and the amazing scene of creativity that it is. And <laughs> after I got married, so whilst I was married, whilst I was planning the wedding, sorry, I'll go back a little bit, I was using an online forum. And if I recall correctly, it was hosted by You and Your Weddings. I don't know if they still exist, but they were a really popular wedding magazine at the time. And they had like a digital forum and you could go and hang out with other brides and share, you know, inspiration and supplier information and all of that jazz. And when people got married, they'd share their wedding reports at the end, which is basically just like a um, a documentation of what, you know, their memory was of the day. And it was all lovely to share it. But when I came to do mine, I shared it. I was sharing chapters of a Mills and Boone book. (laughs) (laughs) And every day during my lunch hour at work, I'd share some more, you know, and it back. And afterwards, and it was absolutely mind blowing. I'm not joking you. Thousands, like thousands of people would turn up to read these installments that I was sharing, which... I guess was that it was at that point that my blogging career started. Yeah. I didn't quite realize it. And I, but I was loving the experience of sharing it and discovering my own creativity and writing as well at the same time. It's, God, look, it's, so much has changed. Like looking back now and recording it all. At the time, blogs were so, so very new. They were a concept that had already taken off over in the States, but they were still new and only kind of, you know, at the fringes really of media at all in the UK. So I I knew what a blog was, kind of, but there were no wedding blogs, Mm. definitely. And there was no, as far as I was aware, there was no really established blog. It was just, a blog was a personal thing that people did. They, you know, like a diary. Yeah. They they just blog personal stuff. But 
the huge American site, Star Me Pretty, was really well established. So I was aware of that. And that's an American-based wedding blog. So um, over in the UK, after I'd got married, there were a couple of people looking at setting up wedding blogs. And I was asked to submit my wedding story and my photographs to share with them. And I was on the brink of doing that around about October time of 2009. And I suddenly got this inkling like, no, I, w- I think I want to do this myself. I want to share my own story. So I did. I didn't know anything about blogs, didn't know how to set one up. I went out and worked all of that out and I shared our wedding hmm. on my site, which I called Love My Dress because that was my forum name, like, all, you know, all one word, Love yeah. My Dress. Yeah. And I'd um, given myself that forum name because when I joined the forum, it happened to be the same day I'd actually found my, my wedding dress. So I was all happy and excited. So, and that was it. And honestly, everything happened really, really quickly after that. So I started my blog and that was in November. I think the very first thing I actually blogged was about Whitby, where I live, Mm. North Yorkshire, nothing to do with weddings whatsoever. It it just took off very, very quickly. So there was a lot of interest in this exciting, shiny new blog concept. I received an inquiry from a photographer and then them saying to me, I'd really like to advertise with you. And I I thought, my God, this is so exciting, Mm. but I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not clear what I'm doing. And I remember thinking to myself, I need to go away and and gather some statistics and make myself a little advertising pack. You know what I mean? I thought I'll give myself a few months to do that. Then we'll see where they are. I'll be really sensible. So this was sort of in, this is tipped over into say the next, early the next year, 2010 time. At the same time, I was contacted by somebody who owned a jewelry business, Magpie Jewelry. At least if you're listening, I love you and I miss you very much. And they made the most beautiful ornate um, bridal jewelry out of, repurposed like vintage pieces and they were going to host an event I think it was at Claridge's in London with a number of other uh, wedding suppliers including Sassy Holford and lots of other quite big names um, Edwina Ibbotson an amazing like she makes hats um, milliner basically the message to me was they were fed up of paying extortionate prices to join these shows that were you know hosted in London they were going to put their own on would I like to go along and um, cover it for them I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I did. And it was the start of networking for me, effectively. It was the best thing I did. It opened up doors to me. It put me physically in an environment where I could see firsthand the amazing creativity and skill that is this industry. And it was just, I could say, the best thing I could have done. That was, I think that took place maybe in January of that year, February time. And then by March, I had actually got myself, oh God, I forgot to mention something even more uh, important. So I was going to say by March, I actually actually had gathered together some statistics and my first advertising pack, media pack, so to speak. Mm. Um, But there was one other thing that kind of put Love My Dress on the map. And that was, there was a Tumblr. Do you remember Tumblr? T-U-M-B-L-R. They were like kind of the first iteration of blogs years ago. I think it still exists actually. It was like a platform. Mm. And you could host your, it was very visual. So it was mostly photographs. Yeah. Well, somebody had a Tumblr in America and she was a fashion person. I think, I think it might've been called What I Wore. She was basically one of those people that shares um, what she's wearing every day as inspiration before it became a big thing. And she picked up on one of the weddings I published, which was this gorgeous 50s inspired wedding. And the, the lady looked like, you know, the bride looked like Audrey Hepburn. And she got these gorgeous lace white gloves. And it was just off the scale, gorgeous wedding. And she picked it up and she shared it on her Tumblr. My God, it sent my stats from here (laughs) to like through the roof overnight, literally. I was like, what is going on? Where's this coming from? I worked it out. I ended up connecting with with them and it was was just great. But those two things, so going to London, getting involved in that event and having a nice boost, you know, at the very start to kind of put me on the map really, really helped. So for March, I took my first, I think it was my very first eight advertisers and then that was in 2010. And then by May the following year, I'd handed in my notice to my full-time job because it took off so quickly. Fabulous. And I can remember my mum saying, oh, this is really fascinating, isn't it? And I don't think anyone really understood what I did for like probably about six years. Like, what are you doing? What, <laughs> what, sorry. Um, but she's like, oh, it'd be so good if you could just stand a bit on the side with Nick, be a bit of money for you, both to do some nice things. And it very quickly kind of took over what I was earning in my day job. Mm. And I thought, I, I, do you know what, Sarah? It's almost like I, I mean, obviously took that leap of faith and mm. handed in my notice. But looking back, I'm like, I had no idea how brave I was being at the time. 
And that's why I say to, uh, to people now, you know, fortune favors a brave, mm. take that leap. You know, yeah. you'll never know what you're capable of unless you do. That's it. Um, but I did, I took the leap and I remember my boss saying to me on the phone, are you sure you want to do this? Are you absolutely sure? Because you've got a safe job here. And I was like, I've never been more sure in my life. It just felt that instinct was kicking in. And again, it's taken me the past 10 years to work out how important instinct is in my life as an entrepreneur. But it, it just felt like everything was aligning. And I've never felt more confident in that decision I took on that day. And God, the rest is history, mm. <laughs> really. So, amazing. yeah, that's it, the journey I took. It's amazing. It is. It's a, <laughs> I think um, so many entrepreneurs can relate to that. And, and unless you've done it, unless you have got that skin in the game, you, you probably won't really understand. But it is, isn't it? You, you get the idea. Yeah. And it just sort of consumes you, doesn't it? And, and, and you, you, you put it out there. And then when you start to see the results, you, you just want more and you want more, don't you? It's, it's, it, it is addictive, really, isn't it? Yeah. Being an entrepreneur is really quite it's an very addictive. addictive. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if there's things I'd have done differently. I utterly winged it because I didn't have a business plan. I was thrown into this very exciting scene where everything took off very quickly. And I just, I think I must have been aware at the time. I just thought I have to do this. I've got to go for it. And it was great. Like I would probably do a business plan now, <laughs> you know, and and do things a little differently. But it was one of those where I've had to learn along the way. Mm. I, I I wasn't a business person before. I wasn't an entrepreneur before that. And I've had to learn a lot. Oh, what since two thousand nine, ten? But you know, some of the best businesses I know have done the same thing. Mm. And sometimes you just really have to take that leap of faith, don't you? you? Because if there's, a, if there's an opportunity there and it feels right inside, mm. what have you got to lose? Exactly. If you, you know, if you're safe enough to walk away from a job that's paying you. Yeah. So, yeah. That's exactly it. And I always say I'd rather be glad that I did than I wished I had. I can't think, that you, you know, they say that it's uncomfortable yeah. going through this process, but I don't think there's anything more uncomfortable than regret, is there? You know, watching somebody else 100%. doing what you'd, what you 100%. had the idea of, you wanted to do, but you just didn't have the courage to launch it. I can't think there could be anything more uncomfortable yeah. than that. Yeah. Mm. Although, like I say, it still amazes me that, because I think I probably was quite naive at the time. It amazes me that I had that courage. Like I, I kind of look back at my former self and I'm like, well done you. Well done for doing that. Yeah. You know, for having that bravery and that conviction to take that decision and just go for it. So and it yeah, is brave. I'm so pleased I did. Yeah, and, it is a big, brave, very brave mm. leap, isn't it? Because self-limiting beliefs, you know, we often say, oh, you hear entrepreneurs say, no, you know, well, I'm not very confident and I've got imposter syndrome and everything. But I think that that actually, it, you know, it's just because they don't really, they, they don't recognise until they actually really do stop and reflect at how brave they've really yeah. been, you know, just to anybody who set up their business, yeah. anybody. I'll tell you something else as well. It's, somebody said something to me, I don't know who it was or when it was, but it was on this journey of entrepreneurship. And someone said, people will take you very much at your own reckoning. It might even be a famous quote I read from somewhere. I just, mm. I can't source it at the minute, but that is so true. It's really helped me shift my mindset on how I view myself mm. Because I think I was that person for a long time, you know, the people pleaser, um, the person full of doubt and thinking I wasn't as good as anyone else and didn't have the capability to turn up for something like this and, you know, or speak publicly or whatever. But if you keep saying that to yourself, then you will be that person. Yeah, that's it. It's just been a constant reminder for me, you know, people will take you in your own reckoning, including yourself. So it's a constant reminder for me to just check in with myself. Oh, if I'm having those thoughts, you know, that are a little bit negative and self-limiting. Just be aware of that mm. and try and whilst you're in this moment and this thought right now, see it from a different perspective. Yeah. Just shift it 180. Yeah. And what would it look like if you were looking at it from your, you know, another perspective? And that's been really helpful for me. Yeah, definitely. So what's next? What's next for Love My Dress? What's what's next on your exciting journey? For Love My Dress, I've obviously had, obviously, because people listening to this might not know me at all, but in March this year, I relaunched my site mm. and... It was very traumatic. <laughs> Redeveloping a website like on the scale of, of my dress is not something for um, to be taken, you know, oh, just, yeah, trauma. But it was really, really important to me that I made a mark and sent a message through a newly designed site that said, this is me and I'm not going to dance to the tune of social media companies that are expecting me to do something else. So... And that's to your question. 
I want to move forward with Love My Dress in a way that feels very authentic to me. And I know that might sum up some eye rolls because the word authenticity and authentic, it's been hugely overused and, you know, all of that self-help and all of these courses are everywhere. But actually, it really means something to me and my business and it guides me in everything that I do because I, I can't do something if it isn't, if it doesn't feel authentic to me. I feel very, very, very privileged to be in a job that allows me to express myself authentically and to project and share how I feel about weddings and creativity and all of that with my audience. And I feel at the minute that there's a lot of flux happening across the social media land that isn't really great. So, you know, there's, um, I mean, God, look at how much meta uh, has lost in shareholder value over the past people are losing confidence I think basically because the nature of these once amazing apps has really fundamentally changed over the past couple of years it's all now about you know keeping shareholders happy rather than I think the user experience and I know I might sound like a complete bore and I get that and I will accept that as well but when it comes to concepts like reels on Instagram and being made to feel like they're only going to work for you if you put your face to camera and you behave a certain way for me is just bs yeah because like part of the allure of love my dress and so many other brands as well is having that kind of mystique you know about the brand and about you know people aren't comfortable behaving that way and why should they have to and i think um going off on a bit of a tangent but one of the fatal mistakes that Instagram made as I say as a once amazing application was trying to become TikTok like to TikTok yes, itself exactly to mm-hmm. gain market share basically yeah um, because obviously TikTok's is hugely popular video app and I think in doing that it completely destroyed what made it brilliant which was photography and community and I've, I mean as you can tell I have some quite strong opinions on this mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I think we, all of us now as a human race, uh, like humanity is absolutely craving a stillness and a place where they can feel it's slower and more considered, you know, and that is exactly what I want Love My Dress to be moving forward. So I don't have any, if you're expecting me to say, I have huge plans to do this and this with it. Actually, for me right now, the priority is to make sure that people recognize it as that slower, more yeah. considered space. Yes. And do you not think that um, the pandemic has been instrumental in this, Annabelle, in that people before they had the opportunity to be at home and they were just rushing through life and they had you know, different priorities, which may have been very much money-based about how much we're going to earn, how much we can earn. And then they've actually come home and stopped mm. and looked and realised, hang on a minute, what have I missed? Do you know what I mean? What have I been missing? You know, and this, and, and the fact that they've been able to be at home and take time and, yeah. and catch up with themselves. Yeah. I think so many people have, have mm. literally reprioritized their life. And I think slow living for many now, mm. slow and author- and, I know, and I know what you're saying about the authentic world, but I think the word, but I do think that people now are just wanting to be free to be themselves because they're realizing that just life is too damn short. 100%. Yeah. You know, and. Um, and also, there's a lot of horrible stuff happening in the world yes, there right now. There is. You know, there is. And yeah. it can it can feel overwhelm so overwhelming. So mm-hmm. I am I have a tendency to get quite drawn into you know the media, what's happening in the news. And mm-hmm. I have to really have a word in myself about stepping away from it. Mm-hmm. Step away from Twitter, Annabelle. <laughs> Nobody's going to get hurt. Yes, because it's just too much. Yeah, it's constant bombardment. And I've also come to realise, you know, God, how naive was I before? But I've also come to realise through the work I did with What About Weddings, and I'm doing now, how divisive the media can be. Mm. You know, a, a lot of it is just. It, it exists to create divide and yes. numbers. I mean, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's all about shareholders, isn't it? And yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. So I have to step away from that a lot, but I'm very, very conscious, more conscious than I've ever been of um, the role that Love My Dress plays in the scene that I'm in. And I feel very responsible for that, Sarah, I do. Mm. So I think I, f- I feel very firmly about shaping it as a place of um, retreat and, you know, just peaceful and contemplative and you know I've even I've reduced the uh, volume of content I'm publishing at the minute I'm trying to work Mm. you know what work out what might feel right for me and I'm I mean it can be scary at times you know because 
you receive all these messages all around you that if you're not going to do the reels and you're not mm. going to do TikTok, your business is going to die a thousand deaths and it's going to be awful and you'll fall behind and become irrelevant. I All I can say is it's that authentic feeling inside. And unless you 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 recognize that, I just know my business is going to be okay without that. I know. I'm, I don't need any convincing. I don't need to go on a course. My people will find me. That's right. If they want to. Yeah. If they want to find um, content that's more considered and beautifully produced that they can absorb and really enjoy, they will find me yeah. because people will tell them I don't need to push that through or, in, you know, I will still continue to use the Instagram and these apps, but not in a way that they are expecting me to, because I think that's really fundamentally wrong. Yeah. So moving forward, yeah. <laughs> what's next for Love My Dress is yes. making sure that I nurture it and I protect it and it doesn't it doesn't become impacted by all of this noise that's happening around at the minute in the social media landscape, which I just feel is so detrimental to to people's mental health. Like yes. for a start, it's just it's too much, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I can tell you agree with me. I'm yes, sure I totally agree do. with you. I mean, this is what this formidable over forty podcast's all about. It's all about um, you know, we we've we've got to midlife and you know on the journey getting to midlife through the decades so don't remind me i shouldn't say that i'm proud to be my age everyone it's okay i'm totally cool glad to be here i am i'm bloody grateful i've had i've had two near misses i'm I'm glad to be here (laughs) i'm not moaning about getting old (laughs) bless your heart i I said it in jest of course i'm proud no but it's true though it's um grateful i i kind of think that we've these last few years with everything that you say that's been going on in the media and the things we've had to live through ourselves with the pandemic and so forth. I think people have re- re-evaluated their life. And that's what I'm saying with Formidable Over 40. It's about being being true and, and authentic because by the time you get to midlife, if you aren't living the life you love, yeah, you really do need to have a word with yourself yeah. because mm. you've got more years now potentially behind you than you have in front of you. So Albeit some people might think that word authentic is a bit crass, but you've got to be true to yourself now. And you, and, I, and this is what I'm saying to, to my client. You are not just mm. a someone's because we have been someone's and rightly so, mums or aunts or mm. whatever, you know, we, or whoever we are. But we've been someone's to get to where we are. But we mustn't lose the fact that we're still a someone. And if we're not careful, we're going to miss that ride. Yeah. Absolutely, one hundred percent. So, getting onto that kind of rolls us onto <laughs> adversity, and you know, midlife. By the time we get to here, we've usually faced some form of adversity in our life. Have you ever faced any adversity in your journey, Annabelle? And if you have, how did you overcome it? How did it shape you? Oh, yes, I have. So anybody who does know me and certainly anybody who follows me personally, because I have um, a personal feed on um, a bit like an open book on Instagram. So I am sober and have been sober now for what will be a decade next year. Just absolutely blows my mind when I say that out loud. Oh, my God. Honestly, where to start? So my, I have had, I did have an alcohol dependency for for, for some years and Obviously, some of those years spilled into when I was a business owner, you know, trying to set up Love My Dress. And in 2013, I stopped. Thank God. I don't know if I'd have been able to do it without my husband. In fact, I don't want to say, I don't know, like it's a really, it's difficult to find the words. Like saying, oh, I dread to think where I'd be feels wrong. I just know I would have been in a really, really, really bad place Mm. without him and the love of of my husband and my daughters and my family. Mm. But I had a dependency and it was all consuming, Sarah, all consuming for many years. And I think I started to recognize it was a problem probably in my mid twenties. And of course you don't think about being in your forties when you're in your mid twenties. I mean, you do, but then you quickly unthink about it because it just feels so unsavory, doesn't it? And it makes you feel, and you feel <laughs> like old. Like, and you when you have a pension snorted. <laughs> it's like, oh, you, oh it's tw- yeah. 40 seems old when you're 20, doesn't it? <laughs> Just seems like an absolute lifetime yeah. away, doesn't it? You know, in the twenties, about living your life and just having a good time, aren't mm-hmm. they? Um, but I was definitely conscious, I think, um, that there was something, something awry there. And then uh, an old, uh, you know, an ex boyfriend of mine raised the issue and said, you know, you, you need to sort this out. And I did try and sort it out a number of times. You know, though I would definitely. I mean, just to paint a picture here, 
I wasn't one of those people who drank every day. I binge drank. So I would get to the weekend and then just completely obliterate myself. My definition of what a weekend is would often be quite flexible as well. So Mm. sometimes it would start on a Thursday and finish on Monday, which isn't really great. But it was uh, so there were periods where it was perfectly manageable. And I guess, you know, you, you hear that term floating around, you know, functioning alcoholic. And I think I was definitely one of those for a long time. And I, as I say, I tried to um, stop drinking. And there were periods, obviously, when I was pregnant, I've had two girls and didn't drink at all during my pregnancies. And then there were other occasions where I stopped for like nine or 10 months, would start running, um, or I'd stop for three months. And so repeated attempts to stop. And it just took me to get to the absolute trauma, absolute trauma of nearly losing my family to realize how much was at stake and the extent of the problem I had. And looking back now, how much, like what an amazing job I'd done from of hiding it from mm. my friends and mm. my colleagues. Because, you know, I remember the reactions of some of them like, do you really have that bad a problem? I was like, you have no idea. Honestly, mm. you really have no idea. Mm. Being on the other side of it now has really opened my eyes up. Like I see, I know when friends and colleagues are struggling. And I also think you never know what's going on behind closed doors. You never know. And, you know, that whole be kind to everyone thing, but people will behave like they've got it all sorted or that they're coping when behind the scenes they're literally, you know, only just paddling away furiously at the surface. But I was able to give up eventually and it was obviously for me the best thing I ever did and like look at at every year now so I I I stopped drinking in July 2013 Mm. and I can't remember the date specifically 28th or something like that just after my daughters broke up for the school holiday and every year on the anniversary of me stopping I I share something publicly Mm. on social media and originally that was a way of me kind of holding myself to account Mm -hmm. Like, I've got to make this public now. And that's another little tool for me just to keep in my pocket, to hold myself to account. Every year I can step forward with a sense of pride and an opportunity to reflect Mm -hmm. and, you know, just log another year. But you would be surprised, or maybe not actually, I don't know, the response that generates privately for me behind the scenes in DMs and messages from other people who are massively struggling themselves. And, and yes, during the pandemic, that was a lot more. So for those couple of years, you know, 2020 and 2021, um, when I was showing my little, you know, another year achievement online, the number of people that were getting in touch shot up because, I mean, there's, there's statistics out there now, aren't they, that mm. um, alcoholism rates went up and people were really suffering, obviously, because it was a terrible ordeal for everyone to go through. Yeah. But it's made me realise how important it is that I do that. It's comforting to know that I've helped people helped even if it's just like signposting them to some help or listening like actively listening to these people who were in the same position I was in at one point really struggling to juggle everything really struggling to believe in themselves struggling with the shame and the guilt that was the hardest thing in fact that was the best thing for me after I stopped the realization that I could wake up every morning and not have that heavy sense of shame or guilt that was so freeing for me so mm. it was yeah. so amazing mm. I also remember uh one of the actresses in Sex in the City is it Kristen Kirsten I can't remember her name but anyway she I think she used to have an alcohol dependency and I remember seeing a quote from an interview somewhere with her she was saying look it was my life and career or the drink I had to make a decision I got to a point where I, I kind of I recognized that within myself but also Sarah make no mistake whatsoever Prior to that, I had looked at myself in the mirror and absolutely, truly, through and through, accepted that I would never be able to stop and that this was my lot, you know? And I would probably be like a haggard 55 year old. (laughs) And I honestly, on every way, on every level, completely accepted that that was my destiny, Mm. which I feel emotional now talking about it because to have overcome that I truly truly accepted that that was what my life was going to be and that all I could do was just be as good a person as I could be you know and be as kind as I could be make sure that my children were looked after as well as I could do at the time so I never ever ever take for granted what I have now I feel incredibly privileged and lucky 
to have made it to the other side because I know so many people don't. And it is a real thing in your 40s because, mm. you know, you get to that age and oh, none of us ever have it truly worked out too. We no. start reflecting and I've had periods where I'm like, what, what's my purpose here? I don't know what I'm doing and I feel directionless and my children are going to be growing up soon and they're, they're going to want to leave the house and what am I going to do? And all of the million other myriad of things. Yeah such triggers for you to turn to some other means of comfort mm. you know mm. and alcohol is so readily available isn't it and yeah I, I have many people who are in their 40s or in their midlife who've reached out to me and as I say it's comforting to know that I've been able to help uh because it's it's far less taboo now than it used to be to talk about it you know it's still taboo but it's much less taboo I think than mm. it used to be so you've got some quite big personalities talking about it. I can't remember. I think it's Sarah Gray. Have you heard of? I think her yeah. name's Sarah Gray. She wrote the um, the is it the Joy of Being Sober or something like that? Right. She's wrote. She's, she's written an amazing book, and she's built a community. I do believe she might be on um, maternity leave now, so not as active on social media. Mm. But her book was a very insightful read for me, and made me realise because you do feel alone. You feel mm. like a complete isolated failure when all when you're going through all of this. Yeah, and. You know, there are absolutely support networks out there and a lot more than there used to be them because I went to the doctors and uh, that was pointless for me. That was no help at all. And I was absolutely desperately at my most what bottom. I went to my GP and they couldn't help. They basically said, well, we can't tell you absolutely where to go to, but I can push this leaflet across the table. Or if you've got some money, you can go to a private clinic. Yeah. But, you know, neither of those things were really an option for me. I need, I was, I needed somebody to literally pick me up and say, we are going to help you. Yes. This is what you need to do. And that didn't happen. And, you know, my poor family were doing their best to try and help me, but I was absolutely powerless to this addiction that had taken control of me. Yeah, the doctors weren't great, but, and then there's other things, you know, like Alcoholics Anonymous, which for me wasn't a thing in the long term, but I went for like five meetings and it served an amazing purpose at that stage in my life. Mm -hmm. It took me when I was at my most low and made me realize that I wasn't alone and that there was a whole network of support out there should you need it. It just wasn't for me long term because of the format, the way they conduct the meetings, there is almost a quite a religious aspect, which I didn't feel too personally comfortable with. Mm. And that's fine. But at that stage, you know, those meetings I attended served a very great purpose for me because they they took me when I was at my lowest and there were very kind people there. And it made me realize that I wasn't alone mm. and that I could overcome this. I think the most important thing those meetings did was give me hope, mm. you know. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. I can tell you about adversity for sure. And that was quite a tough, ta- tough stage, sorry, of my life. Uh, but I have overcome it, and I will never claim to have done it by myself because I truly believe I couldn't have done it without support of my amazing, amazing family. Mm. Mm. But I'm just so grateful that I'm here today, and that I've been able to, as a result, really throw myself into my business in a much more strategic sense um, and run it in a way that feels much better. Yeah, you know, for me. I mean, you've there shown you <laughs> such ph- phenomenal strength, Annabelle. There's a couple of things I picked up while you were talking, and one of them said that you 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 felt incredibly lucky, and lucky's a word that I struggle with sometimes because I sometimes think that's attached to imposter syndrome, right? Because you may feel lucky, but you've created the change. You created the change. You you had the courage and the strength <laughs> I know, to set I know. up. No, but it's yeah. important for people not to dismiss what they've mm. achieved. And I'm really passionate yeah, about right. people yeah. not dismissing how hard yeah. they've worked to get to where they I'm are. I'm not dismissing it, yeah. No, do you know what I mean? Because yeah, you had I, the courage. Yeah. You could have gone off to to university or done all of these things and followed a different path, but instead you put a stake in the ground and you followed your gut instinct and you chose the entrepreneurial route. And by thank the thank the goodness that you have, you know, um, (laughs) because someone who's in the wedding industry, by we wouldn't want to be without you. You know what I mean? And then you've you've faced this. Bless your heart. No, but (laughs) we're going to come on to 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 this in a in a moment. But then. You know, look at that challenge you faced there. You didn't get out of that through luck. You got out of that through putting a stake in the ground and saying, (laughs) I want change. I'm going to change my life. And you work bloody hard to do that. 
you know, and you're 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 a tower of strength, oh. and and I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, if you want to change, luck isn't going to come along and 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 just and make the change for you. Mm. You've got to put that stake in the ground and say, I've had enough. I I want to Do you know what? change. Yeah, you're so right, and I I didn't mean it to sound like I. No, I of know. Of course, of course, I have I have made those changes, and it's mm. so important to to you know share that message with others mm-hmm. who are listening as well it's so true i think for a long time i didn't believe i could make that change and i think mm. if there's one strong message that i want to come out of this is to say to people you have to believe in yourself because you are capable of far far more than you think you are yes and that is coming from an experience where i've really genuinely been at that end of the spectrum where I didn't trust myself anymore. Mm. That's a pretty low place to be, actually. Yeah. You know, where you you can get through a certain portion of your day and then you're constantly thinking about where you're going to get your next drink and how you're going to smuggle it in without anybody seeing. Mm. That lack of self-trust is utterly debilitating. Mm. But you are capable of changing that. Yeah. And it might mean that you need some help, external help from people who love you or from yeah. people who are trained to support yes. you in that respect. But you're right. Ultimately, it is you mm. and only you that can pull yourself out of that. And I constantly wanted to change things. I just didn't feel capable. I felt it was almost like I was um, just giving into it. Mm. I felt completely at the whim of this addiction. It's, I, you know, it's, I used to describe it to um, somebody like, it's like a dark shadow over your shoulder and you can sense it coming along and and when you look around, it's gone, but you know it's there. Mm. You know it's there all the time, and it's so overpowering. Mm. And it feels like they have full control of you. It's very, very, yes. very scary. Mm. But you are absolutely right. Ultimately, you have to be the person that pulls mm-hmm. you out yeah. of that. And that when, can be a yeah. really scary. And when you do, acknowledge, acknowledging how strong yeah. you are and being really proud of yourself. I am proud of myself. And, yes. And that shouldn't be something that sounds like, it makes you sound like, you know, you're ashamed or anything. No. You know, or embarrassed to say. Not at yeah, all. I am. Thank yeah, you, Sarah. Absolutely. So absolutely. <laughs> now, let's get on to the what about weddings, because goodness gracious me, we talked, t- touched on, Ooh, the, yes, on the pandemic okay. earlier. Um, but, you know, what a turbulent time it was for so many businesses. And the wedding industry, you know, was certainly hit incredibly hard. Now, you set up uh, What About Weddings with your colleagues, Tamarin and Jesse, and you offered so much needed support and, and became the voice of the wedding industry. Can you tell us about What About Weddings and the experience of, of launching it during the pandemic and, and you know, and 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 how and why it was so vital to to the wedding industry, and especially with mm. the, even with think how things are. We've got the budget today, haven't we? So we're waiting to to hear. Oh, yeah, as you soon know. as we finish this chat, yes. I'm straight off to see Tam and Jesse about the budget because yes. it's we're yeah. It's, yes. I don't think it's going to be great, but oh my goodness, where, where to no. Start? So tell us about what about wedding? Share share with us. You know, um, you said there. You know, how did you launch it? It wasn't even a launch. It just happened so organically. So. <laughs> At the start of the pandemic, it was a, it was a tricky time for me because my father had not long passed away very suddenly and unexpectedly. So he passed away on the 30th of January and we'd only just um, held his funeral at the very end of February. And I, you know, looking back, I remember having conversations with my brother-in-law at my mum's house and we, we were talking about this, this strange illness coming out of China and there was stuff on the news about them throwing up hospitals in like two days, do you know what I mean? Mm. All that crazy stuff. And I remember thinking oh, this is all a bit strange. You never for one minute had a clue what was lying around the corner. Mm. But of course, it all kicked off in the March. I can remember uh, the Prime Minister. So we all knew that he was going to say something on a certain day, was it Friday or Monday. We all knew that it was possibly going to be, you know, some big announcement, um, some big kind of lockdown thing going on. I remember watching it on the news and just feeling like I was crumbling to pieces. Mm. Like, oh my God, like all of the kind of fear happening to me in an instant yeah. this is going to destroy my business what does this no one's going to, like advertising means nothing in a situation like this does yeah. it and I remember going to upstairs finding my husband we were literally weeping together he mm. I found him in tears mm. um and I just that evening I remember going to bed barely slept I remember looking at the skylight and staring at the stars and just thinking what what does this mean 
this could be the end of everything. And uh, that fear, I'll never forget that fear coursing through my veins. Something just happens that night, uh, an epiphany, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. But I just realized waking up that morning that I couldn't sit around doing nothing. I had that kind of right. This is it. Roll your sleeves up, love. You've got to get to work. Do what you need to do. I knew I had a platform that could reach lots of people. I thought I've got to put that to use. So with a colleague, I set up a Facebook group and very quickly that amassed like, I think five and a half, six thousand, maybe even more members uh, in the wedding industry just to come together and talk about what this crazy situation meant, uh, what we were going to do, what it meant for our livelihoods and our businesses. And um, before too long, because of that activity, Jesse Westwood, who is the founder of Studio Sorara's, an amazing luxury wedding planner, and my lovely friend Tamron Settle, who is a celebrant who works with me anyway, we gravitated together and started to talk about how we could campaign on behalf of the wedding industry. So we did. And, you know, I, I can't even begin to describe to you, like my life has so fundamentally changed since working with those two women on that level. Mm-hmm. I, I can't even almost find the words, but it was the most incredible, eye-opening, energetic, exhausting, amazing, rewarding experience all rolled into one. Yeah. So obviously things didn't get better very quickly at the pandemic and our initial attempt to um, campaign very quickly kind of, you know, ramped up into much bigger efforts to, you know, make media appearances and start writing press releases and really shining a spotlight on the utterly devastating scenario this was having on the wedding industry and people's lives and livelihoods and how we didn't want to be forgotten. Um, And Tamron and Jesse brought so much incredible energy to that project um, I mean, we were literally just throwing us up. There was no plan. I mean, there was a plan when we'd get together and talk about, right, what we're going to do. Mm. We've got to um, work on a campaign that's going to really uh, entice people and get people involved and, you know, create that swell of support. So they're very smart planning in, in that sense. But otherwise, it was just go, 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 you know, fight, fight, fight every day. Yeah, uh, It was totally exhausting, but amazing. But those two women bring an incredible energy to the room. You know, they're both quite politically minded super super smart intelligent very driven and not saying that I'm not mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm, I, I like to think I'm those things but I quite you know the techie person we all bring something very different mm. into the mix of what what about weddings was and it just meant that collectively we had this amazing energy I think and we managed to secure the support of many members across the industry which really was the power of what about weddings it was mm. the industry itself the people you know who really made time to get behind it but you know, 2020 was crazy with with nonstop activity and us doing as much campaigning as we could. Uh, and then 2021, I think it might have been at the back end of 2020, moving into 2021, that we were contacted by um, a sort of really major, big international lobbying firm who'd seen the work we were doing and said, we want to work with you. We want to support you. And so we worked with them and they were amazing at, you know, helping us craft together communication for number 10 and you know helping this sort of um open doors to meetings with ministers that kind of thing um it was really really it was it was looking back it's insane because like I say we just didn't stop it was non-stop every day um but it had to be done and I think the best thing that what about weddings did was provide a sense of glue for the industry you know yes. like togetherness and community at a time when everybody just really felt so lost and felt invalid like what they were doing wasn't important as other people and of course you know many people in the industry fell through the cracks when it came to financial support as well yeah unless you were a salaried employee on a payroll then you weren't going to get furlough you know and unless you'd been working for a certain period of time you weren't going to get a grant There were 2 million people who fell through those gaps and got absolutely nothing, most of them in the hospitality and creative industries, which is absolutely appalling, totally appalling. And there's still actually very active campaigners who are driving that message forward now because the fear now is that the budget's going to um, screw things up all over again for people and make it very difficult to run a business, you know, with increasing business rates and the like. So, yeah, what about weddings stood for and represented a really good thing during the pandemic. It brought the industry together. And that was amazing. But Sarah, by God, it was exhausting. I mean, I didn't do many, I don't think I did any of the press interviews. Jesse, 
I remember this one particular day. I mean, she was constantly on every major news channel there she was, was mega, every major wasn't she? Mega. radio channel there was. Mm. She would do Tamron as well, but yeah, there was one one day in particular where she was literally back to back BBC, Sky, and mm. right through from the early hours to eleven o'clock at night, she was doing radio interviews. And I, I mean, what a woman! Honestly, that was the level of dedication that I think set that campaign apart. Yeah, where you got name checked in Parliament next to Captain Tom for the campaign campaigning work. It was just, you know, we were mentioned in Politico as making waves at Westminster for um, the noise we were creating. Yeah. It was phenomenal. Like looking back at it now, it's it's unbelievable. I can't, it's, it's, it's absolutely mad. Um, and we are in the process now of morphing that energy into what we'll be launching as a, an industry membership community yeah. early next year. Ideally would have liked it to have happened this year, but you know, <laughs> life and many things have happened along the way but we have been by no means quiet over the past few months we've been working together furiously behind the scenes and making some some big plans to kind of take the energy that was created um through what about weddings and turn it into something really positive you know a space where people can join and feel really a part of something and be educated and feel supported as i say and, supported you know, have that community mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's where we are at the minute. But yeah, it's it's completely changed my life, honestly. It's taught me a lot about working under duress and uh, um, supporting other people. And um, yeah, I, I could speak all day about it, but I'm so thankful that it happened. It took me, I mean, bear in mind that we could all actually return to work legally last summer, so summer 2021. I would say it took me until this summer, 2022, to really start processing what happened for me and my mental health throughout the whole experience because I was very happy to give but it was exhausting I know I've said it a few times and I don't really think I started to properly address that until sort of so like I say summer this year <clears throat> and maybe there's still a bit of processing to do in that respect it was exhausting for everybody who went through the whole for everybody everybody who went through you know business owner or not but just I'm only speaking for myself personally it was a lot to kind of you know, process and unpick and like, I've got time to think about this now. What actually happened there? But again, it's, there's so much I've learned that's helping me, you know, run the business how I want to run it now and, and deal with life as a 40 year old as I want to deal with it now. So yeah, I think it it gave me so much more back Mm. really. Yeah, I can remember that. I was thinking, oh, my God, what is going to happen here? Because obviously, well, not obvious, there's nothing obvious about it. But, you know, my partners and I lost a business in 2008, which was a big corporate event business. And then this happened again. And I'm sat yeah. here with 10 franchisees looking at me through Zoom and saying, what are we going to do? You know, and I was thinking, shh. I don't know yeah. what we're going to do to tell you the honest truth. I really don't. Yeah. We're just going to have to mm-hmm. stay visible, hold our clients' hands the best we can and pray to God it goes over mm-hmm. quickly and we get come out the other side, you know, and thank heavens that we have, you mm-hmm. know, and as a team, stronger yeah. than ever. But um, it's been tough, yeah. hasn't it? And, and, and you guys were phenomenal. That's good to hear because I think a lot of, yeah, it, well, thank you. I think um, I'm very, very mindful of the precariousness of it all right mm. now. I think because so many businesses, my own included, are still in recovery. Mm. Ours are still in recovery. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Bounce back loans have to pay yeah, back. Yeah. Um, people's mortgages are going up. Rates are going up. You know, yeah. domestic rates are going up. Commercial rates are going up. It's and goodness knows what's going to happen. I mean, they haven't. They couldn't have made it any more blunt, could they? That it's going to be tough a tough one today i mean literally i think the budgets might even be happening right now as we talk i think it's 11 o'clock um, isn't it something so like that there's a real nervousness mm. yeah there's a real nervousness about how this is going to impact weddings in general yeah and you know the ability to recover and survive mm. but you know we we are a really tough strong industry yeah and i like to think that if we can move forward with the levels of support we created over the past couple of years, then, you know, we can only do our best, can't we? Yeah, We've got we to can. lift each other up and support one another. We do. And that's where, you, you know, you mentioned about, you know, before being an entrepreneur and a founder can be an incredibly lonely place. It can be incredibly lonely. And especially when you're facing adversity and trying to battle through things on your own. And that's where your What About Weddings community really is going to come into its fore because it's going to be there as a supportive network. And and I think it's when it's, uh, you know, oh, I'm not on my own. That that feeling of, of 
you know, thinking, well, crikey, I am not, I'm not on my own. And, you know, hopefully together we can, we can get through this because that feeling of loneliness really is dreadful because that saps your motivation. Yeah. And if you've got no motivation and no energy, yeah, it's just such a struggle to push through, isn't it? It really is. I think for a lot of people like myself, I work on my own, literally mm. physically. I don't yes. get out very much because, you know, I live in rural North Yorkshire and mm. I don't have those water cooler moments. I don't have colleagues no. around me in an office sharing mm. space here. It's me. Yeah. And I'm sh- I know actually that that's the same for a lot of people in this yes. industry as well. They start their businesses on the kitchen table mm. and, you know, they're doing a lot of work from home. People have let go of premises over the last couple of years yes. because it's an expense they can't afford in the house. So there is more being done at home. So yeah, it is, I think, more vitally important than ever that we all feel there is a space that people can turn to and just feel like, as you say, they're not alone, there's support there and that people will listen as well. Yes. Um, I think it's really, really important. It is. And I think leading on to, to from what you've just said there about the working from home, so many people are working from home now and lines can become blurred of, of for that work-life balance. And, the, you know, the last thing we want is burnout. And mm-hmm. through my mentoring with, with the female CEOs, that's what I'm getting at the minute, a lot of burnout, you know. What do you yeah, do yeah. to ensure that you've got balance you know a good work-life balance in your life yeah what what, what where, where do you turn good question and I'm certainly not going to claim to have cracked it it's mm. something that I keep aspiring to uh, because I um I find it very hard to switch off but I definitely have um a, a, a toolkit now I think that helps me stay on track I mean one of the most important things I think is to s- set boundaries work time wise you mm. know and again, God, if my husband's listened to this, he'll probably be laughing his head up. He's like, oh my God, you work the most ridiculous late hours at night. But it is really important. And I am getting better at that because I'm a night owl. Mm-hmm. And there's there's research, isn't there? You are either one or the other. Yes. You're a morning, you know, early bird or a night owl. And I have been a night owl for years, but I am married to somebody who's not a night owl. So, we were, you know, I don't want to be like ship passing in the night with him. I want to share a life with him and go to bed at the same time with him and, and all of that just. So I've tried very, very hard to change my routine in the day so that I am stepping away and switching off at a more <laughs> at a healthier time in the day yeah um also you know putting my phone on on do not disturb that kind of thing to be honest it's on do not, do not disturb most of the day mm. but also rut- routine is the most important thing of course isn't it Tell you something, Sarah. One of the things I started doing in the summer is take cold showers. That's yes. Are you, are you familiar with the Wim Hof method? I am. I've just, I've been started reading the book, but uh, I'm not. I don't know if I'm up to the cold shower. Bit yet. I tried a few in the summer. I it thought, doesn't I sound thought, as bad. I, I thought I could handle it in the summer. My son was doing it. I think he still probably does. And I thought, right, I'm going to give this a real try. Yeah. And on a hot day, it really didn't seem so bad. But now with the rain and the freezing weather outside, I don't know if I can be so hardcore. It's all about mindset, Sarah. I oh, know. It's oh. all about mindset, and actually, um, the ru- the routine thing. Because your eyes are the routine, and and actually, you know, I mean, so look for anybody who's not familiar yeah. with it, Wim Hof. He's um, and I don't know what you would call him a a self appointed guru. Yes. He, he he is someone without any ego. Anyway, I yes. find, but yeah. he he does these breathing exercises, and mm. he's the guy that's kind of kicked off this whole step into a freezing cold bath. Mm trend you know but what he encourages you to do I mean there's absolutely proven research for what he does being an amazing thing for your nervous system Mm. basically and of course if your nervous system is in good working order then you are capable of working better making better decisions being more productive Mm. getting better sleep the benefits are you know yeah just so many but he encourages getting into the cold Mm. um, because it's activating your you know nervous system and he does that by this system of, you know, having a 30 second cold shower every day for a week, then a 60 second cold shower. After, this is after you've had a warm one. So mm. have your lovely warm shower, mm. you know, wash all over the bubbles, mm. then turn the dial. Uh-huh. <laughs> turn the dial, Sarah, that's cold. <laughs> I'm trying. For 30 seconds for a week, <laughs> then for 60 seconds for a week, then for 90 seconds. Um, and then for two minutes. So two minutes. Uh, and I do it every day. Right. All I can say is, I feel better. Yeah. That Sarah and possibly the HRT that I'm taking <laughs> <laughs> as well. But it, I really, you know, it might, I don't think it's placebo. I think it actually, because it's the mindset thing. And as I'm taking these cold showers, there are some days where it's easier and I'm in the zone and I'm like, yes, girl, 
get this cold shower, enjoy it. There are other days where, oh yeah, it is a little bit harder, but I step out and I feel alive. I actually feel like my I've activated something inside me and it feels on the very rare occasions that summer where I haven't done it, if I've been busy or, you know, you know, it's not taking a wash in the morning, I miss it. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So little things like that. Um, I mean, your question was, how do I set boundaries, I think, but I think routine is the most, most important thing. And just, no, it's just work-life balance. You know, what, what do you do to make sure that you've got that good work-life balance for you? So you're not working all the time. I just, I mean, God, you just have to step away. Unless I get out and walk, I haven't been walking most days just of late only because it, look, there are some periods where you just have to work, right? That, I'm sorry, is yes, just part of being an entrepreneur, it. isn't it? Yeah, you know, it is. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. If you've cracked this thing where you can do that, as, you know, has anyone have these power really? Hours has anyone do really? Walking. I don't know if they have. <laughs> no. And do all the walking and do the, all the things and be there and present for your husband and your children. Hats off to you, honestly. But there are periods where it just goes to shit, basically, for want of a better expression. But I do on, on the good days and on, in the good weeks and the good months, then if I can walk first thing, and just feel like I'm prioritizing that before mm. getting to my desk. So in the summer, it's easy, of course, because you've got longer, wet, you know, light hours in the mm. day. Um, I don't mind walking in the dark, but I'd rather not. So um, I do that. And I'm really, really trying to prioritize my health. I'm much more aware of my health and making sensible choices around my health now than I ever have been, obviously, because I'm 48 and... You know, I went to the doctor recently and they said to me, you've got early onset arthritis. I don't believe I have. I think I've, I think I've done a yoga position wrong <laughs> <laughs> and I've done something to my wrist. But those little things like wouldn't have been said to me 10 years ago, 15 years ago, suddenly I'm aware that mm. you know, I need to take care of myself, yeah. including my mental health, getting enough sleep because I'm not going to be the best version of me. I can't show up. I need to be healthy and sharp and on it. Yeah. I'm running my own business. I'm running another business. I'm about to set up with my friends. Mm -hmm. I have got to be on it to support my children as they're making their way through teenage life, you know, and be the best support I can be to my husband. And I can't do that unless I'm taking care of me. So I've definitely become aware of how much more of how important it is to have those boundaries. Yeah. I'm not perfect at it but I'm getting there and I'm I'm much more conscious of it on a day-to-day basis so the walking and you know the cold showers and trying to you know physically step away at a sensible time as well yeah and do immerse myself in other things it's yeah getting there Sarah no brilliant that's (laughs) absolutely brilliant well sadly we're coming towards the end of our of our interview and it's been an absolute joy and I knew it would be I couldn't wait to to uh to see you and and chat to you again there'll be hopefully many people listening to this and they might be feeling stuck Annabelle and they might be really desperate to to reinvent themselves and and become the someone rather than the someones if you were to pay forward one bit of advice to them what would you what would you say trust yourself and pay attention to your intuition learn how to listen to those intuitive nudges and those instincts yeah and a guide yes um, immerse yourself in, in all of the podcasts and the books that will help you do that mm-hmm. because practice absolutely makes it better and yes. easier but trust yourself because i think i said this before in a conversation but you're capable of doing so much more than you realize uh, but listen to the that guide that exists, whatever you want to call it. I like to call it my intuition. Listen to that because it, it exists to put you on the right track. Uh, just practice tuning in, listening and, and adapting whatever decisions you make in life based on that. So trust yourself. Yeah, it's the biggest, biggest piece of advice I'd give someone else. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's absolutely wonderful, Annabelle. Now, where can the listeners, or if you're watching on YouTube, the viewers, find more about you and Love My Dress and what about weddings? So you can visit lovemydress.net. That's my main site. And what about weddings? We're actually, there, there is a website there now at whataboutweddings.co.uk. However, we'll be launching a beautiful new one. It's just a basic site there now. So we're launching a new one in January. And then on Instagram, I'm love my dress and also have a personal account, which is open. I often have it closed, so it's private, but sometimes I open it. Mm. (laughs) Depends what I'm sharing. Um, And you'll find me there at Annabelle B. Forth. And people can check the show notes if they need to check the name spelling. But yeah, I'm over there as well. 
So I think I'm on LinkedIn. I know I need to make more of an effort on LinkedIn because people keep telling me I need to. You are um, on LinkedIn. I like, tagged you yeah. this morning. <laughs> I tagged you and Love My Dress this morning oh, did to, you? to tell my, 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 my lovely connections that I was um, looking forward to interviewing you this morning. So you are there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, bless you. I'll actually... Bless you. I must. I need to get into a habit, and I I did try because honestly, all of my really clever, smart business friends say you need to be doing more on LinkedIn. Yeah, it's and I a know, fab platform because I know it's become actually quite an incredible. Yeah, yeah it really is, and and a lot yeah. of opportunity there as well. Huge. And, <laughs> Because say, to be honest, some of my biggest contracts have come from me reaching out to people on LinkedIn. So, yes, for me, uh, definitely. Yeah, I, I, need, I need to sort that out. Yeah, it makes mental note to self. Yes, yeah. <laughs> mental note, LinkedIn to-do list so Annabelle yeah all I want to do now is to thank you so much for for joining me this morning it's been an absolute joy so thank you for listening to the formidable over 40 podcast thank you so much to the incredible Annabelle for joining us and sharing her advice and her business journey you can find more information about the things we've discussed on this episode in the show notes make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on future episodes and please do share this podcast with anyone you think will enjoy it or need it thank you Annabelle thank you Sarah it's been an absolute joy thanks so much thank you